Good morning, everybody. So today we will continue with the summer school and uh, the topics of today is kind of trying to acquire data that we will need for our modeling. So we will try to focus today on which are the techniques and what are the ways in order to acquire the information that we need to do both validation or personalization of our flow models. And we start first with trying to talk about the gold standard in some ways, because what is very important is when we do modeling that we need to be able to validate whatever we have. And the best validation currently is still doing like optical methods with uh, particle tracking. And it's my pleasure to have Pilar Arroyo here, which is working in the University of Zaragoza, and she's a physicist and leading a lab on optical techniques in order to do measurements, especially of complex flows. And these are the things that if we use complex geometries with complex flows, we need to get like real measurement of as close as possible to reality so that we can uh, validate our model. So it's my pleasure. Pilar, thank you for coming. The work thank you. I finished my degree almost 35 years ago, a long time ago. And all I have learned about vascular flow is because of the interaction I have with groups that were doing mostly simulation. So they were doing simulation, they wanted to have some data, so they came to us uh, for obtaining this kind of data. So because you are more interested on vascular flow than on the optical techniques, I will start just with a summary of the kinds of flows we have been applying our techniques. So the first one, uh, the pointer, I can use this one. The first one, we started with the aneurysms. This is a medical image of what an aneurysm on the, cere on the an intracranial aneurysm look like. And it's like a balloon is when the, the arteries uh, becomes weak and it uh, can start growing and growing and growing and finally exploding. So we got three images, clinical images of real aneurysm, realistic from uh, real patients, and we build them up uh, in glass. We have a glass blower at the University of Zaragoza, which is, goes quite good, so this is one example of this. We also did some models with silicon, which are supposed to be flexible, and they really were flexible. This was built by a company in uh, Switzerland that are very good with this kind of uh, modeling. Uh, then, uh, later on, we work on this kind of problem. This is related with thrombus formation and the problem that thrombus uh, gives when it reaches the heart or whatever. So we wanted, uh, there was a group that wanted to simulate how the flow was going to be like on a vena cava when they put a anti-thrombus filter that was supposed to catch up the thrombus. So this is a commercial filter, simple one. And uh, this is a vessel model where we put the filters in. And I will show you some, example, some results on this application. Uh, later on, someone gave us a bulk silicon model of a carotid bifurcation. So the, this bifurcation can also be patient specifically done because it's done with 3D techniques. They excavate this uh, model inside the silicon. And later on also, we, were, we, we thought about getting data inside real vessels, which are not transparent. All, all of these models are transparent because our techniques are optical techniques. They need to have optical access to the flow. So we thought that maybe with an endoscope, and we try to use a, a, a commercial endoscope, we could reach inside the vessel. If I have time, maybe I will show you something about this. This is the last part of my talk. Okay? So because the idea is to give you information on what can we get and what you need for simulations. I have uh, wrote down this, uh, these things here. So maybe you know already when you do simulation, what do you need? 
well, you are going to need information on the geometry of the model, 3D geometry, because simulation is always done 3D. Nobody does 2D. It's always 3D. The computers are very powerful and the techniques are very powerful. Uh, and also, what I've learned is that what you need is, of course, flow rates. This I can understand, but also pressures at the input and at the output. This is what you need for the simulation, and this is what we have tried to measure in our experiments. And of course, liquid properties that usually they are about the same as the blood, although the blood is a Newtonian liquid, and usually this part is not model. Usually it's Newtonian. Very little differences. So what are your simulation variables? I guess usually is the velocity field and the pressure. I not measure pressures, but I can measure the velocity field. And what are the measurement requirements? They need to be non-invasive techniques because I don't, I don't want to change the flow when I try to measure it. Uh, if they are full field, full field means at least a plane is better than if they are only a single point. And also, if you have high spatial and temporal resolution, that is much better because you can follow better how the flow changes with time. So from my point of view, the main characteristics of the vascular flows are they are liquid flows, which means that the velocity are lower than when you compare with air flows, which is better for experimental techniques. It's easier to take data. They are confined because you see, you have this shape or you have a cylindrical vessel. It means the optical offset is not big. And also because the geometry is complex, even a, a, a cylindrical vessel is complex geometry regarding illumination and recording makes imaging difficult. But we can remove this complexity by placing the model inside a rectangular box filled with liquid with the same refraction index of our model. This helps a lot. This is what we have been doing usually. And one good thing is that the, the flows usually are either steady or periodic flows, which means that it's easier to get 3D data because if they are periodic, you can take different planes, for example, always on the same point of the uh, waveform, always. So you can reconstruct a 3D image of, of your model with 2D data. 2D means two-dimensional. Okay? So now, if we go back to what I like most, is optical techniques for whole field measurements. So in the group I'm working with, we have been uh, using these techniques, as I tell you, for 35 years. I started really with uh, this kind of measurements, which is velocity in a flow in a plane, when I was doing my PhD. So what have been what we have we been measuring with this technique? We have been measuring displacement. This can be done either on a fluid or on a solid, for example, on the vessel wall. Displacement on the fluid means velocity. On this one plane, we get the in-plane velocities. If we use a different technique, we get only one component, which is the out-of-plane component. So we combine the two of them to get the three components of the velocity. If it is not a uh, fluid, but it's a solid, we will get deformation, in-plane deformation or out-of-plane deformation. So we are, I'm going to be talking most about this. We can also measure shape. Okay? We can also measure surface corrosion in the range of micrometers when a surface is, being, is losing material because of the uh, agent that is being corroding it. We can measure this. We can measure refraction in this when something is being changed two liquids are mixing, and we can also measure particle sizing, okay? So the basic features of our optical techniques for fluid velocimetry are drawn in here. So this is the fluid area. This is a illumination beam, and then we record this. The fluid needs to have something that scatter the light that is being used for illumination. This means it, inca it can be either natural scatters that are, for example, in the blood, the cells that are moving with the blood could be good enough. If, if not, for in vitro experiments, we usually put particles in there, micro-sized particles. And because the sensors can only detect intensity, this is a photograph. This is a photography. This is the first, the very first technique. This is well known in fluid velocity for a long, long, long time. At the beginning of the years, maybe 100 years ago, 
They were using what is called particle tracking. They were in the, in the identifying particles, following them one after the other. And velocity is always measured as the ratio of displacement divided by time interval. Okay? 35 years ago is when they started to do uh, a statistical analysis, correlation analysis. You don't need to identify particles. You can have more seeders, and then you can have more resolution, higher spatial resolution. And this is what is called particle mass velocimetry, which I will talk to you in the next slide, and which is now very, very, very much used in every experimental fluid mechanics laboratory. There are commercial software and commercial uh, uh, equipment. But the light that reaches the sensor, which we will call the object beam, the light scattered by the particles, has information only on intensity, but also on what is called phase. The phase of the wave. This is a wave coming. And the phase is related with the path the light has been traveled to. If the path is longer, the phase is bigger. If the light is shorter, the phase is shorter. But there is no sensor that can record phases. They only can record intensity. So how can we do the phase recording? Then what we do is we mix the object beam with a beam that comes also from the same source. And these phase differences from one point to the other change into intensity differences. This is called interferometry. So this is a recording where the intensity here is directly related with the phase difference. OK? The, the only requirement is that this reference beam has to come for, from the same laser that the illumination beam is coming from. Because even if you have two lasers that are identical, one and the other, they will never, never, never interfere. Because the phase of the waves they are producing are never, never the same. So this has to come from the same laser. But this would need just a very small part of the beam, so it's no problem. The only problem is that if you use, for example, white light, the coherence length of white light is maybe a nanometer. So if it is a nanometer, just exaggerating, the path from one beam and the path from the other has to be exactly the same. So the coherence length is something I will talk more later on, on these techniques. OK, so as I, as I told you, we, we need to take two recordings at a suitable time interval that we can select with our cameras and with laser so that the displacement of the particles are what we want, either a few pixels or nanometers or whatever, whatever the technique we are using on. And as a rule, the special time has to be a tenth of the time interval because otherwise, if it is too long, the particle would move. And instead of having a very nice and fixed position, it will be like a straight. And this will not help. Increasing the spatial time will not help in those circumstances. So the intensity and phase change related to the displacement. And we have high temporal resolution because it's fixed by the time interval and the recording speed. Most of what I'm showing here has been used with a high speed system, which means laser firing at 10,000 pulses, 10, uh, 10, pulses per second, camera going at 1,000 frames per second, this kind of technique. They are CMOS cameras. And it's high spatial resolution. The high spatial resolution depends on the camera. If we have a 2,000 by 2,000 pixel camera, this is our resolution. If we want more spatial resolution, we will look at a smaller area. If we, want, if we don't need su such a big resolution, we will look at a big area. So changing the area we are looking at, we can change the spatial resolution. OK? So this is the first one. And then I'm going to do this. OK. So the basic technique is when we use photography. It's the simplest one. It's this one. And it's called particle in mass velocimetry, as I told you. Uh, when we use this on solid mechanics, it used to be called speckled pattern photography or digital image correlation. Speckled means because when we illuminate with a laser anything, we never see something which is smooth. It always has like dots, speckles. Okay. So in, in solid mechanics, it's called a speckle when we use a laser. And it's called digital correlation when you use white light and put some paint on the surface, which is another way of doing it. So for this kind of thing, laser is not required. We can use any kind of light. But lasers are good because you can put more power in a narrow light sheet, usually. And usually, we use a light sheet. Okay? And uh, this is an example. Just for show, these are. Oh, 
these are not the real um, PIB images. Okay, this is an image taken with le the laser firing at something at about 1,000 pulses per second, and the camera acquiring at 50 frames per second. So we have here a multi-exposed image. So we see really very well how the flow is changing. We were changing the flow rate by hand. So it's a, it's a non-constant uh, flow rate. So what are, how the real image look like? The real image look like this. You see? Also one exposure in one frame, the next in the second. Do you see the change in velocity? Okay. So because we see which one is the, fir the first image and which one is the second one, we can know not only the velocity, but also the sense, the direction, if it's going, going right to left or left to right. So how do you analyze this? Okay, I have this one here. This is, is using a statistical function with this cross, cross correlation function. This is the first image, this is the second image. We select a area which usually, which usually is 32 by 32 pixel. So this is our spatial resolution. And the next window, you usually move half of this. This is the standard on, the, on this technique. And this function gives us a peak. And the position of these peaks tell us how much the particles in this area has moved when we have changed the time in the second recording. And you see there's one peak, so it means they can move zero, and we can record it. We can, they, they can move a half of a pixel, and we can know it. So the lower, the lower displacement we're measuring are very low, and the high, usually 10 pixels or so. We don't want the particles to move more than that. But this cross correlation function numerically is not calculated as the cross correlation function. It's calculated in the version where there are two Fourier transforms that are being done. Okay? And this is being shown here. This is an image from the good, good old times when I was doing my PhD. No digital medium, only film. So I have here this. And let me see, you see this. Do you see something? Okay, is this? Because when you illuminate something with a laser beam and look in the infinite, you get the Fourier transfer of what is here. If you put a lens on the focal plane of the lens, you will see this Fourier transfer. So this is the Fourier transfer. If I go in the center, we see, let's see, they are horizontal. So particles are moving vertically. Then I turn around, then change. Okay? So just this, the spacing and the orientation give me the modulus of the velocity and the direction. And on the old old times, I was just using something for measuring this with degrees and then measuring the distance with a ruler. But later on, you could do this on the computer. Okay, so this really is the cross correlation function of this image with its elf, which is main autocorrelation function. So when you have all the portions in the same recording, because we don't have, you don't have a camera fast enough, but you have a laser fast enough, this is what you get. You get three peaks. And the problem is that when the displacement is smaller, these peaks mix with this one, and then you have errors. And also, you know which one of the two peaks is the, the direction of your displacement. But this is the way it's working. And what is the output? The output is always this. This is the output of a, a software from La Vision. It's one of the main companies on this area. And this, is, this is plot here is uh, mm, two components, velocity, map. So these are vectors showing the direction of the velocity in each point, in each 32 by 32 pixel region. And the color usually is the modulus of the velocity or whatever you want to. You want to do the horizontal component, the vertical component, you can plot it as you wish. So the only thing you have to take into account is that this vector is not fixed by this, it's fixed by this. It's always the projection or you velocity vector in the plane perpendicular to the observation direction, okay? In this direction. So in these points, it doesn't matter if there is motion here, but if we have motion here, we have some errors on the outside. So this is being used for measuring three components. How can we measure three components with this kind of technique? Like with the eyes. It would take images 
from that plane from two different directions, then we'll have different projections, and from two projections we can get the three components. This is called a stereo PID. It's also a commercial technique and is uh, used very often in gaseous flows. In liquids, it's a bit more complicated because the imaging through a liquid has some problems, but you could do that. However, because this is difficult in fluids, we have proposed a technique, which I will explain you later on, where we can measure this third component with the same setup, without having to look from two different directions, okay? So, just to not be too boring about optical techniques, just I'm going now showing to you an example, a vascular flow example, which is this one, the vena cava filter. All we did with this, uh, in this application was PIV, normal PIV. So this is uh, a human body, as you can see. This is where they place the antithrombos filter. This is where the thrombos used to be formed on the legs. And when they go up and go to the heart and so on, you have problems. So they put it in here. They put it for a while. And then they remove it. And luckily, they will have removed the thrombus you have there. Uh, on that time. So how did we uh, mo uh, model this on the lab? We bought the piston pump where you can put a uh, different kind of uh, flow, flows, physiological flows or steady flows, and we build all this circuit, and here is our model, the vena. This is all for measuring the pressure in and out of the pump because it has certain size uh, tubes here, and this is uh, different tubes here, and we measure also pressure here, uh, inside and outside. When the flow is steady, no problem, everything is the same. When the flow is periodic, changing with time, like in a femoral or in a carotid or in whatever, one of them, then there can be changes on pressure both in shape and in position. In, in this kind of flows. We didn't know that, but I know fluid mechanics people later on, I talked to them and they already knew that. For us, it was a surprise to find this kind of technique. So the, the, model, the model for the vena is just a silicon tube with this length and these diameters. It's not really, really like a vena cava. I've been told that the vena cava is much thinner, not uh, two millimeters in thickness. So when the flow goes through the vena cava, it spans and collapses much more. But this was good enough for the people working on simulation. So they, the, what they model was this one, even if this was, was not really a vena cava. These are the pressure sensors we were using. So we have to open up this and place them in here. And these are the flow rate. This is based on ultrasonics. So we could put it in and out without having to change the, the circuit. Uh, these are the flow rate of my pump, and these are one of the uh, waveforms we were using. Okay, and as a fluid, this is the mixture we were using, which uh, for really for us was important. That is similar to blood, but also the refraction in this is quite similar to the silicon. So we didn't have refraction in the exchanges while looking at it. So this is important, okay? And this is a photo of the setup. This is the camera with the tube in here. The laser is coming from the top by using some optical arms that are being sold by the companies. Uh, this is how the flow rate sensor looks like, and the camera is here. We also have another camera on there. We can use both, and we can do one technique with the other one and the other technique with the other one. Okay? It could be. This, you can see here the commercial leg, and this is the model of our thrombus we, we did. So here you can see how the, this is for a steady flow, constant flow, how it look like. This is for visualization, okay? For measuring, we have only one image in each uh, frame. And this, we, we first check everything by measuring the flow in this area where it's not perturbed, disturbed by, the, by this uh, filter, and we, we got the typical Poisset flow, and we compare the flow rate we could in calculate by integrating this area with the flow rate that we measured with the pump. So the agreement was quite good. So we were quite happy that the, the flow was working as expected. 
that was the first test. And here I, I showed you the resolution. This is what corresponds to 32 pixels with this magnification. Maybe you can see here that it looks like there is one, two, three, four, five different areas. Okay? And this is because, of course, we have measured the whole area at the same time, but then we will lose a lot of resolution in this area. So the camera is 2,000 by 2,000 pixels, so we want to look at an area which is almost square. So we have to uh, put together the different areas, and for that we were using some algorithms for edge detection. This corresponds to this area, and then just have an overlap area from one image to the next one, and we were using that to overlap. We were moving the camera, the, we were moving the box, this box in here, just shifting, maybe 20 millimeters, we have a ruler there, we move 20 millimeters to get the, the, the next region, then the next one, and then overlap all of them. And I think the overlapping was quite good. Okay? Then, these are uh, the vector fields we can get uh, out from those data, and just shown um, plots at different positions to see how they look like. Okay, you can see, of course, after this, this bit, after the tip of the filter, the flow separates in two, and we have this. We can calculate the flow rate in each of these lines by integrating this area, and we could measure that it was okay. Everything was, uh, was in good agreement. And in here, well, here, here we, have, we have, have been plotting in colors the vertical velocity. Without the filter, vertical velocity was null. Everything was horizontal. But because of the filter, here it was going down and then up. What you can see here on the, on the vectors, just the orientation, here is plot as a ISO contours for this component of the velocity. And then, in this paper, Marina Nicolás that is working with you now, as I believe, um, what she, she was doing the PhD on the simulation and she was using our data for comparison. So this was what we measured, that was she simulated, and this is the comparison between uh, simulation and data and measurements, okay? We also measure with the thrombus, and they did simulation with the thrombus, but what happened is that, can you see something different on the filter from the previous image to now? Do they look the same filter or not? Does it look the same or not? What do you think? Is it, is it the same or not? Not. What do you see? Yes. No, but this is the thrombus. What about the legs? Are they the same? Uh, it's not really torn. We always try to put this in a certain position because it's also important for simulation for comparison, and we try to put it vertically. But what happens is that one of the times we have to remove the vessel, put the filter, put it back again. So none of the times the person that was working with it removed it very quickly and the filter was squeezed. And one is squeezed, it's impossible, impossible to put it on the exact shape as it was before. So it doesn't matter. So this is probably why they, they didn't compare because it was a bit difficult then. Okay? And then we also did measurements with uh, one of these waveforms, femoral. So you can see how it looks like. And you can see that there is flow which is reversed, negative and positive, which was a surprise for us also. And also with the, let's see, one moment, what happened? This happens. <laughs> I have to start. Okay, while, while this start, you can put this on and pass it around because I will try to show you something. Else. Look at the bright dot and try to have a bright dot somewhere in here. And then I will explain what you see. Is the bright dot there? Yes. Pass it around. Well, where are we now? This one, this one, this one. We put it in here just in case. Okay. 
Are you finished? No. But he's around. Okay, but I want to do this. No. I want to go where I go, where I am. Okay. So this was the flow with us. So you see? More interesting than that, isn't it? Looking at the dot. <laughs> well, while, while you keep talking at this, uh, looking at this, I can uh, go to the next application, just telling you first what we did with PAV, and then I will explain you what you see with, the, with this thing we are looking at. Okay, so the first application on the biological flows that we started was this one, the aneurysms, and these are the three patient-specific patient models we got. Uh, uh, we had the images taken at the clinic with the MRI that you all know and you all like. And we gave the 3D representation that Dr. Franke was doing on the computer. He, they could, they, the representation could be turned around and we gave this to the glass blower. He did these three models. The one on the bottom is three and a half centimeters. It was in the head of someone. I don't know if it was alive or not, but it was in the head of someone. The one in the middle is about one centimeter, and the one above is about half a centimeter. The one above, we never could measure it because there was a lot of uh, bubbles on the glass around. It's not because of the size, it's because of all these bubbles. So we have mostly studied the one below and the one above. Okay? And this is the setup, similar to the one before. Okay? And these are the results. This one is only for show. This is for visualization. You can see the vortex that is being produced in here. It looks very much similar to the shape of the aneurysm because the aneurysm shape is being induced by the flow that is going inside. So it means that the glass blower did a very good job. Where are the rovers? Still there? Okay. And this is this is the velocity field. And this is the velocity field in this case for a plane that was in this direction, okay? Because the, the fluid was entering in here. This, this model is the one that uh, was compared with simulations also, okay? So now we come back to this part, which is the optics again. Okay, so as I told you already, if I mix the object beam with this reference beam, then my technique is not photography anymore, even though the sensor is the same, it's interferometry. And interferometry me measures phase differences, only measure one data phase, so it gives you only one information, one component. Okay? But the component depends on the illumination direction and on the observation direction, as I will show you soon enough. Okay? So in the old times, when digital was not the usual way, the technique was called holographic interferometry. It was made with film, like the photographies, and there are very nice images of holographic interferometry. Then, with the digital means, it started to be called digital speckle pattern interferometry. And the images from this technique were just simply, we record two images, which are called specklegrams, grams because there is an interference between the reference and the object. Just two of them, we subtract them and make the modulus, which is the difference, and this could be done even uh, analogically with electronics, and the output was something similar to this. It was not exactly this. I don't know what happened with the previous one. It was this, not similar to this, okay? And here, just the color tells you the face. I will tell more of it. 
And then they started saying, well, if I place this reference bin in a certain position, then, then I, I can do something which is called spatial phase shifting. And with the spatial phase shifting, I can have something a bit better. Okay? And then they realized that they could get not only the phase, but also the intensity. So they could get the particle images with a little bit more noise than with, with particle image velocimetry. So then they call it holography. So this is the name we call to this technique because we were the ones that proposed this digital speckle pattern interferometry for fluid velocimetry. It has been used for solid deformation, but never for fluid velocimetry. Okay? Where are the goggles? Where are the, oh, oh, still there, okay. So now is the video. So the, the image we get with interferometry, they always have this speckle noise, so we have to filter it out, which is this. And then here is just an example. Oh, no, here, a little video of five or six images corresponding to a constant flow, which was not really constant, uh, since, uh, constant, fully constant, because it depended on the pump. Ah, and one thing I see, one thing I remember, I haven't told you. On the photography technique, maybe you saw here that it says image space. On the photography technique, on particle image velocimetry, the measuring ruler is the speckles on your camera. Then with magnification, you go to object space. So this is why I was telling you always 32 by 32 pixels, displacement of 10 pixels. So in interferometry, the ruler is the wavelength of your light. So it's always object space and the displacement is of the order on the wavelength. So we are talking about a factor between 10 and 100 in sensitivity between interferometry and photography. But in fluids, this is not a problem because we have two time intervals, one for interferometry and another one for uh, PIB. So we can measure the three components with different, different time intervals. Okay? Where are goals? Or they are still? Let's keep going. Okay. So this is the this is the example of this setup. The fluid here. This is PIV, and then we put this. You see here the light sheet is going from left to right. This is the illumination direction, and then this is the observation direction. So the velocity component we are measuring is this. This is called the sensitivity vector. It's the bisector of illumination and observation. From PIB, we measure the components in this plane because this is perpendicular to the observation direction. So they are not three perpendicular components, but we can obtain the three of them by combining the information provided by the two techniques. And this is an example of what it looks like an image blown out, a small area, and this is in a fluid. Okay? So you see this image, this is, the, this is it's called a spectrogram, but the image without the reference will look similar. So you say you can say, well, this is a bright image, a bright particle, another bright particle, another bright particle. These are smaller particles. There is some kind of pattern like an interference. So this like interference is due to the reference beam. But you see they are all circular. So this is called a spectrogram because the interference of two objects, two of two beams, of two waves. Okay? And just by subtracting by making the difference, which is the absolute value of the subtraction, this is what we get here. And this is the equation that corresponds to this image. There is a relation, the real relation between intensity and phase difference. But the problem is that there are other patterns here. I, I not is the intensity of the beam at that point. It can change. So it's very difficult from here to obtain quantitative information. Okay? However, where are the goggles? Ah, then you have to pass them to part. Okay? So, however, what happens if we go and place this in a little bit different position? You see, there is an angle between the object and the reference beam. Can you see the difference from here to here? What do you see here? How, do you, how will you describe this image? How will you describe it? Not yet, but more specific. No, because the focus is always circular. The left will the form in which direction? They are not circular. They are like lines, little lines. Which direction do follow these lines? Do you see the lines? Do you see they are the lines are mainly like that? 45 degrees. So what it means is that by doing this, in each of these 
dots, which we can think of them as speckles. The speckles has always the same phase. I have introduced a modulation. This is what is called special phase shifting. Okay, so this modulation allows you to say, well, I can get the phase of each of these dots by comparing the intensity of three pixels, one next to the other, because we have here a modulation introduced by the angle. So this is why it was called special phase shifting. And then we get this kind of images, which is what I really showed you before. In this case, it's not very clear here. You have black, gray, white, black, gray, white, black, gray, white. So you have the sign because here you only have black and white and you don't know what is increasing or decreasing. So with this one, you can know if the phase is increasing or decreasing and you have, once you filter this out, a direct relation between the gray level and the phase. Okay? And then, this is what you saw, isn't it? Yeah? I can show you also these ones. This is what is being used on pointers, when you have money, dollars, dollars, dollars. This one is better. An ovni. <laughs> And do you see, apart from the central one, there is a one top, bottom, left and right, do you see? Okay. So this is what is called laserless Fourier transfer of something. Because when I put the laser beam and look at the infinite, this is the Fourier transfer of what is here. When you look with your eye through this, Again, you see the Fourier transfer on your eye because the lens on your eye is almost at the focal length. So these are all of them, this one also, they are Fourier transfer holograms. So a Fourier transfer holograms just requires that the reference beam is divergent, which is good for digital means because when it's divergent, like the object beam, the angles are smaller, so we don't need a high, a very high resolution, spatial resonance we don't have when we compare with the film. Okay, so this is a good option. And when you do the transfer, transfer, what you get is whatever it is on the point, on the focus of the reference beam. Okay? So with the, with the image I was showing, if you do the full transfer, you get this. So what is this? This is the aperture that we have on the lens. And this is because we have placed the origin of the reference beam at the same distance as the aperture of the lens. And in a hologram, and this is, like, and this is a Fourier, a lensless Fourier transfer hologram of the lens aperture. So we have in the middle the beam that is direct one, is not being deformed. And here, one of these is the real image of the aperture, and one of them is the virtual image of the aperture. The advantage is the face on one of the apertures is just the opposite of the other one. So if we select one of these apertures and take the inverse Fourier transfer, we go back to our sensor plane, and we get there the face and the intensity. We get both of them. Okay? And if we compare, subtract two faces, we get this which are images usually cleaner than just subtracting the speckle runs because you see we have removed all these things that come from everywhere. You don't know. When you do this interference, there is anything on your field of view that can, in, that can be included there, that can influence your speckle run. Okay? And this is one you filter and unwrap because here the phase, you only know it's 0 to pi, but we don't know if it is 0 to 2 pi or 2 pi to 4 pi. There is this unknown that you can only calculated by unwrapping. Unwrapping means that I see the phase is increasing, so I put zero here. When I go to two pi, the next one has to be a bit bigger than two pi. So it will go four pi, three pi, and so on. We will plot it wrapped because it's easier to see it. Okay? So this is what uh, we can do in this case. And this is a typical hologram reconstruction. Here is the focus of the reference beam, here is the aperture, they are on the same plane, this is the object. So this is, this, this was one, our proposal for using in fluid velocimetry. So here is the fluid plane, 
So we are doing an image plane hologram of the object. This is why it's called digital image plane holography, because on the sensor, which is the hologram, we have the image of the object. But it's at the same time a lensless Fourier transfer of the aperture, which is what allows us to discriminate between the real and the virtual images, because otherwise they will mix together. Okay? So now uh, I am going to show you an example of the Wood Old Times. This is my PhD, 35 years ago or so. This is the image. I was showing you the, the fringes here. And this is a relevant convection cell. We hit up the bottom, we keep the top at a fixed temperature, and this starts moving. It was a small cell, and we, used, we were using only 5 milliwatts laser, which was a surprise at that time because everyone was using already one watt of course laser, ruby lasers then. And if we look at the mid plane with PAB, we could see this. This is for visualization. Well, and this was the real image we were using at that time. And when the, the temperature difference was increasing, we see this. We can see that the patterns were different. So this one was described as two rolls in this direction, and this one was described as two rolls crossed by two rolls. Because at that time, people were using just a, either Doppler velocimetry or a projection, um, shadowgraphy, or something like that. Okay? So we end up knowing that it was something like this. In this case, this was like a toroidal flow. Everything was going up in the middle and going down in the corners or so on. But nobody knew, because the computers at the time were not powerful enough, how were the streamlines, the 3D streamlines of that flow. Okay? So in this case, uh, it was the first time that we show that uh, with this uh, DSPI or the, or the IPH technique, we could measure the in-plane velocities. This and this comes from this image. And then this was the other one, and this was the out of plane. So you see, this is not symmetrical. The, the beam goes, the sensitivity vector, the illumination goes in this direction, Vx. And observation goes in Vy. Okay? So the component was a mixture of this and this. I don't see this. This and this. Okay? And the asymmetry in this image, in this image, is due to the out of plane velocity. Okay? So that was the first time that we used this for measuring the three components in this box. This box was so small, 25 millimeters by 12 millimeters and a half. You cannot do stereoscopy at all. You cannot do stereoscopy at all. Okay? So then what else we did at that time? This image, I have shown you the Fourier transport, but this is what is called spatial filtering. Okay? I can do optically a filtering of this image and get immediately isolized for the horizontal component and the vertical component. Okay? And then is what is standard. But then, because the flow was steady, uh, we started saying, well, this looks like a two-dimensional flow. Is it two-dimensional or not? Well, yeah, the, let's just calculate the 2D streamlines. And then we see there are spirals. They are not circles. If they don't close together, it means there is an out of flame component because the streamlines has to be close. So we have measurements accurate enough that when we do this derivative and integration path, we could see they were not 2D. Even in the middle, nobody was expecting this. They expected that near the wall there was some transition, but they expected a big region in the middle that was two dimensional. It was not. So then we said, well, let's go and do a 3D analysis. So we took several images for several planes. 15 or 17 placed along the this perpendicular composition. And then we use the continuity equation for calculating the out of plane component because we didn't know about the interferometry, anything about the interferometry by then. And then, then in this case, we could have the three components, 3C, on the whole volume, 3D, and also we have the limits that were velocity zero in the, in the box, completely zero. And then we can calculate the 3D stimulus. And this is what we got. This kind of thing. The flow is going like this. Let's go to the middle, make a big spiral, and go back from the outside. If this distance is longer, the outside is bigger. If this distance is smaller, the radius is more similar. So this is the only way to fill out 
this area with 3D streamlets that don't cross each other because they cannot cross. And then we check that for the three-dimensional area, it was exactly the same pattern. So at that time, we could calculate where, how the fluid was really moving and how the 3D streamlet would like, uh, look like. It, look like. Okay? Then computers came, the people from Tarragona, Rovira Vigil, we worked with them. They did the simulation and then came to our lab to check on their simulation. And they, they proved this. They proved, I don't know if proof is the book. But what else we can do with this kind of technique? Well, you see this? How do you think this is obtained? Just by placing a reference bin in a different point. One, two, three, four, five, six reference bins. The easy way to do this with six reference bin is to use a fiber optics multiplexer. So we did this with a continuous laser because we tried with the pulse lasers, but when the pulse width is five nanoseconds, the energy is so huge that the fibers destroy. So I've been waiting for a long time for the hollow core fiber optics to be developed to see if we can use it with high speed laser, okay? And you see that we always have the two images, just always uh, on the opposite direction going through here, one, one prime, two, and two prime, but then we can select one, two, three, four, five, and six, and then we could recover the phase from each of the six planes independently. So we could do what I did plane by plane on the convective cell, we could do it simultaneously. We could record this simultaneously and recover it independently, and we could do this in a flow that is steady. Oh, it's not periodic. If it is periodic, you can move it uh, a long time. So this is an example on the same cell with just two, because two, we can do these two with just optics, not with fiber optics. So they look different. If they were not reconstructed independently, we would see nothing, we would see nothing. Okay? So now, what else? What are uh, all, all other problems? Other problems we have is that uh, when we use the usual pulse laser like this one, this is the one that goes up to 10,000 pulses per second, although we usually use it for 10, 1,000 pulses per second, uh, the coherence length of the laser is not good enough. Okay. On other lasers like the ones that go at 10 pulses per second or so, they put something which is called an etalon and they can increase this to centimeters or even meters. But I, have, I haven't seen this done on a high speed laser. So what we discovered was that the coherence length is about 10 millimeters in air. So because the beam is traveling in this direction on the fluid, we never ever can recover the whole area at the same time. If it was a solid, because the light travels like this, I could, I could record the whole area of the solid object because the phase, the distance the light has traveled to the surface will be exactly the same, but here it's increasing. So in this example, the light was coming from here to there. So we thought, well, what we can do? Well, in the reference bin, I can overlap three, four, five, six, whatever number of beams I want, each with a different optical path. And the optical path is changed just by going through different amounts of glass because the refractive into the glass is different. So we have this setup on the lab, which is here. And once you have it aligned, you can, you can take it from one laser to another, to another, and put it wherever you want to. So this is something that uh, artificially uh, uh, enlarge the coherence length. So here is an example. If we use only one of these paths, which is R0, we only see these images. You can see the Fourier transfer here. You see the images of the aperture. You see the face map, and you see the intensity. When you use the next one, which is a bit longer in panel, we see something inside, maybe farther on, and farther on the fluid. So with this example, if you put the, all of them together, you get the full image of the of the of the aneurysm it was in this case. And you see here the Fourier transfer in the whole image. Okay, so this is the only way to access the face in an object like this that is only two centimeters. What we have been doing now in a flow which is not biological is increase it until 80 centimeters. And we have been su successful doing certain things. Okay, so just keep going with the vascular flows. This is the aneurysm example. In this case, I'm showing you some results by, of, of, from two planes, plane A and plane B. They are perpendicular to the main flow. 
the main flow is in, in this direction. Okay, so this is the phases images, filters, smooth, they are nice. And as I told you, in each pixel I have information about the one velocity component. This is the in-plane component measured with PIB. And the combination of this with this gives me the perpendicular, this one. And here the same. Okay? This is not exactly the same as this because the horizontal component is, con is contributing some to this space map. This is the little bit inconvenience. If I could make them completely perpendicular, we perfect, but you cannot. You cannot do it. You cannot do it. Okay? And this is the simulation versus experimental uh, data. This was done by Salvatore Chito, that's some of, of you know. And while he was at the Rovira and Virgil University, he came to our lab to take the data from PIB. From PIB. He only compared really the PIB in a certain position. He was the one that told me what the difference inlet and outlet means from the clinical point of view. You have up there anterior carotid artery, left, right, all these nam names that you probably know more than me about this. And this is an image from the same orientation. So this is PIV and this is a simulation. I think they are uh, colors here means the absolute value of the velocity. No one component of the other. So they are very similar. They use this for a challenge where there were several groups doing simulation and then comparing the results. He also showed in that paper this, which is this plane, a perpendicular one. I'm showing this, which was taken in a different moment to show you that they are quite similar. It's not exactly the same position. One of the difficulties of this comparison is that you need to know well what is the shape of the model. Uh, they have been measuring the shape with MRI, I think. They take this model to the clinic and take the data and they make it. We also try to do it by imaging several parallel planes, but then it was difficult to compose. Okay? So these are some results on this example. Ah, and this is the flexible one. Okay? As I showed you. The problem with these silicon ones is that they really don't make them patient specific. I think they could but usually they make something like it's like a round blob or so. So this is an example of the velocity vector map. This is the two components from PIB. In this case, we use two cameras. We look from the two sides because usually the data, when you do PIB on one camera and this on the other camera are a little bit better. There is a little bit less noise. And then the combination. And one thing I wanted to show you in this example is, do you see these lines here? You see I, I have lost everything here. Do you realize the time intervals? You see, for PAV, it was two milliseconds. For interferometry, it's five microseconds. And here, I'm putting 100 microseconds. So what do you think this could be? Two images. The, the flow was constant, in theory. It was a pump with two bulbs pushing like this. It was not a piston pump. So what do you think this could mean? Any idea? These are the walls of the annulus. What do you think this could mean? It is wall deformation. It is wall deformation. The, 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 the wall, the vessel, the pump was having very, very little changes in pressure. If we repeat this experiment with the piston pump, uh, with the piston pump, no fringes here. But the other pump was just two bulbs that was pushing at different frequencies when you wanted to, to measure the change the flow rate. So they were pumping. So they were introducing very, very little changes on pressure. So it means very, very small changes on the deformation of the walls. Because this was different points of this pressure valve. So it was repeatable. Hmm? So there is more information here. Here you don't see anything because there are too many fringes too many fringes, and then you don't resolve them. Okay? And the last technique I'm going to be talking to you is holography. We have already talked about image holography. This is going to be holography in general. 
when you think on holography, people always think 3D. I can get everything. So in this case, we are focusing on volume illumination. And of course, with intensity and phase. Volume illumination. We could do it in this direction, and it has been done, but from, from, for digital recording, it's much easier if you do it in this direction. Because you almost have to change nothing. Nothing. In fact, you see here, this is like a photograph. You don't need to change anything. And you see how the low hollow looks like. When you send a laser, and this can be done also with maybe just with a white light. You don't, you don't have, or with a LED, you don't have high requirements on goginess because everything goes along the same path. Okay? So when you do this, you always see this kind of thing. A dust, uh, a little dust you have on your lens will give you these fringes. This is the AD pattern, ring fringes. A particle you flow plane will give you these fringes. Anything will give you these fringes. Just if you illuminate and look, you will see that with or without lens. Okay? So in this case, what happened is that the face cannot be used uh, as before on an interferometric analysis. The phase it was allows you to recover the position of the particles. So when we go to this volume illumination, we are reconstructing particles and we are tracking particles. So we are sort of using the correlation analysis to improve a little bit the particle displacement, but what is more important is the particle position. Because what happened is that in this case, in the direction of the optical axis, the accuracy of the particle position is worse than on the transversal position because when because the aperture of the image is not too huge, a particle which is spherical or a dot will transform in something like this. Something like a cigar. So we have a big area. The intensity is not the same, but we have a big area to look to place the particles. So this is the main problem. Okay? So here you can see. This is a hologram of particles that were something like 150 microns or so. They are really big. This was a two-phase flow, OK? So if we reconstruct the images, what we call zeta zeros, where they are more or less focused, these particles look like this. But three millimeters away, you could still see something that looks like a particle. So the main problem with the software, and this is what we are working now also, is in detecting where is this particle. Because then I can place there the information on the velocity of my flow is in this point, not three millimeters away in one direction or three millimeters away in the other direction. Okay? But because we are reconstructing particles and using intensity, our ruler, uh, no, because we are reconstructing, and after taking the, the sensor, we go back to the object space and do the reconstruction here. Okay? So again, it's object space. The ruler is the object space. But because the analysis is being done on particle position, it's not on lambda. Lambda is not the ruler. The ruler is the pixel position on object space. If the camera is 10 microns, if I look in at a very small area, it means that each, uh, each uh, pixel will correspond to one micron in object space. So this is the ruler. The, the pixel uh, size is on object space. OK. And what we have proposed recently is a way to uh, avoid the, the virtual image. When you do the reconstruction, you don't see it here, but this is the focus image, which can be the real image. And on focus, I mean, big, big, big rings, very faint, are still here. They seem to not be seen. But when you calculate the displacement, they contribute to the displacement. I will show you. So our proposal was, why don't you use a Fourier transfer hologram to remove one of them? And this is what we did three years ago. Okay? In this case, this is illumination. And here, this is only for expanding the beam. And here, between the lens and the sensor, on the focal plane, where the illuminating beam is focused, we put the aperture, and left pass only half of the Fourier plane, plus the dot, because this is the reference beam. And you see, the reference beam is this origin, so a Fourier transform will recover the information on the Fourier plane, which is this information here. 
Okay, so this shows one of the aperture is the real and one is the virtual. If we don't put anything, both will be here, overlap. Okay, so our goal is also to increase the amount of particles we can put in the flow because that will increase the spatial resolution. So these are some examples with a glass plate covered with particles on one side. This is what it looks like, normal digital image holography. You see all the rings, they are perfect. And this is how they look like. You see only half of the design. And they can be like this or like this. And it means if they are like this, they, can be, they will be in front of, this, of the hologram. If they are like this, they will be behind the hologram. So this tells us some information also about the Z position. And this is the position, because position is the most important problem. This is positions recovered from the usual digital hologram. This is the focus image, the real image, and this is the virtual image. So if I go to the symmetric plane, I also get the particles. It is in focus, but it's in a different position. So I have to select one or the other. And you see many of them are go, go to the middle because they know if they are looking at this or this one. And this is what we get. We are completely removed the other thing. And then what happens? This is the position. When this moves, if this point moves to the right, this one also moves to the right. But if this point moves up, this one moves down. So the, not only the position in Z, but the velocity in Z is a huge problem on this setup. It is not here. And this is what it shows. Here are the displacement. Here, on the normal ones, there are problems here. In our system, they are not. OK? So now I think this one is a nice one. Again, a flow. Although this one is not being modeled by anyone. It's just checking the technique. Can't you see something on the left? Something moving. So these are the particles from the flow. So what is the rest of it? The rest is that we have the bulk silicon that always has something, something in the bulk. So everything that changes density will give you a pattern. Okay, so how can we remove this? Well, because that is static and the flow is not static. We take 200 images, average them all, and subtract the intensity from the hologram. And then these holograms change into these ones. Well, this, is, this has been also um, rescale the intensity for better show. So these are the number of particles we are looking at. So we are trying to get positions and velocities from this. This has been done, the analysis, one week ago or so. And here is what you have. So the, we place the, the artery, the, the carotid artery, in such a way that the motion is on the plane x, y. There is nothing on between, or in, in, the, in the perpendicular, only on the x, y. Okay, so here, uh, Julia Lovera, which is the expert on this uh, technique, is plotting the position of the particles and the displacement in colors. This is the velocity component, the velocity modulus, the velocity on the plane, okay, in colors. The colors mean the velocity. Well, as you know, this is, has to be a Poisson flow. In the middle, it will be brighter, the velocity will be bigger, and near the walls, it will be near zero. And because there is a bifurcation here, the velocity will be bigger here than here and here. This is this so more or less. Here we have red and also green and whatever because we have the whole volume, the whole depth, okay? And this is a perpendicular plane, two millimeters thickness. All the data that are on this sheet of two millimeters are plotted in here. So what would you expect in here regarding colors and dots? Would you expect the dots moving in this direction or not? Z is perpendicular, will, should, they shouldn't move. The velocity is zero. And then what would you expect here? Well, we, you would expect here, high velocity here, and then another circle with a different, and another circle with a different one. Because it's a, what a, a Poisson flow is this. It's like a, par a paraboloid, paraboloid, okay? So this is without aperture, and this is with aperture. You see this area is a little bit better. There are less streaks of this, which means that the Z is uh, better, the Z position is better recovered, but we are still working on it and trying to improve it. And we are using this just as a test. Okay? And then, well, I think maybe we can stop here. I will not talk anything about the endoscopes.
If you have questions, I think it's about time, isn't it? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this interesting and especially very enthusiastic talk. It's nice to listen to you and especially with the examples. Maybe a little bit of a practical question. Say that one of us wants to do a simulation and we say we want to validate it. In order to do this type of experiments, what does it take? Is this you have a model and you measure it and an hour later you have the results? Or what's the practicalities? How long does it take in order to do this type of images? For me to get the data. Yeah. With PIB, uh, you mean everything is set up? I take the images and then the data. Well, and first also to make the setup, eh? it's like to, is everything, is this something that out of the box, you say like just give the object and we put it there and we measure and, or is it a lot of work like this, no. this type of images to get like 3D Okay, photos. okay, let's start. Three techniques, PA is very easy, very easy, it's like you just, you can do it even with your phone. You take your phone, you look at your area and you only have to change magnification. Because there are no requirements and coherence or whatever. Okay, so this is easy. Then, if you want to do interferometry and you have a laser with a short coherent length, that can take you days to set up. And in fact, we have now it set up for this mixing flow from the Rovira and Virgil University. And to change it to be used with one of the surroundings will take us weeks. Even though now, I have, because we have to, the path may be two meters. And you have to match it within one millimeter. We now have a lot of spin, but it takes, it takes a long time. And for this, the setup, easy to. The same as PIB, nothing, no problem, okay? Then analysis. So PIB is easy to set up and easy to analyze because you can do your own software in Malda, you can buy it from a company, or you can even find it for free on the internet. There are com so that's easy. And running it, very fast. So that's the fastest, the quickest, and it can give you some information. Analysis from the IPH, one is done, it's always fast. Once the setup is done, you take the images, the same time it takes you to take the, the PID, and the analysis is also on the same time. The only thing is that we are the only ones doing that. Nobody wants to do it. La Vision, long time ago, the first time we discovered that, we were in a European project, and they told us, they saw some interest on commercializing it, but for whatever reason, I think they, they thought it was too difficult to set up. So, and then this one, easy to set up, and for this one, we are running the analysis on a cluster, not in a normal computer, because it takes more analyzing. And we are still fighting to find out which is the best way to detect the position. There are different um, things you can try. So Julia Lovera is the expert in this one, and it takes maybe one day. And in which situations do you want to use which techniques? Okay, the way we have this set up, you can only use it because of the way the hologram is being for, for sizes or about the size of the sensor in transversal, in depth, wherever you want. But you have to take into account that you have 2,000 by 2,000 pixels, you have 4 million points plus multiplied by the grade level you have, did the amount of the conversion. So you have something which is very deep, very deep, then you may have a lot of particles. So you have to decrease your seeding. So then the resolution can change. And also another thing is that even if you don't want to look at the whole depth, if you illuminate in the volume and the whole depth is with particles, you will see them all because there is no way to remove them. So if you can do this, oh, for example, on air, and you can see only part of it, you could do that. You could use a small area and a huge depth because you will look only a certain area. But I think this can be also modified to look at bigger areas, adding one more lens or so, it could be done. So you are asking about sizes, okay, for this one. And the other one, PIB, anyone, any size you want. They have, they have done it also on, on big wind tunnels. The only thing again is the same. If you look at the big area, your spatial resolution might not be good enough, so you have to have a compromise. In wind tunnels, what they do is they put a lot of cameras because you have the laser view, you can put a lot of cameras, a lot of uh, laser if you want to, and you can look at whatever you want. In, in vascular flows, um, normally you don't have such big flows, so I think you could look at the whole area you want. And the page, you know, 
with these four core beans, four times uh, enlarging the coherence length, you can look at three, four centimeters. So. And you also mentioned that you could see sometimes the wall deformation yeah. would have a vessel. So is it in principle possible to measure and the flow pattern and the wall deformation at the same time? Or can you extract the information from it? We didn't extract it because uh, that was not a priority. So we have the images, they are very nice. We think we know how to do it, but we haven't done it. Okay? The, only, the other thing I forgot to tell you is that um, we also saw the formation on the, on the Vena Cava wall because you remember I showed you the edge detection. Okay? So when we put the pulsatile flow, the edge were moving a bit. Again, we didn't analyze it because the student finished the PhD, he, he was not interested in that part, and she didn't finish it. But you could see in that direction. It means that with the Vena Cava filter, with the, that Vena Cava, the deformation perpendicular in this direction was big. There were big changes in pressures. In the aneurysm, the deformation was not anything that should be there. And in fact, we also put this pulsatile flow through the aneurysm, but because we ordered it very, very thin, because someone from here told me I have an aneurysm and it doesn't deform, it was so thin that when I put the pulsatile flow, the aneurysm collapsed because the change of pressure, and I was afraid it would explode. So I didn't put that flow in there. Any other questions? Thanks for the talk. It was uh, really interesting. Um, I was wondering, um, so the examples you showed are, are done on transparent models where visible light can penetrate. Uh, I was wondering whether these techniques could be used on opaque uh, models or even on uh, people uh, yeah. with other types of electromagnetic waves that could uh -huh. penetrate. Or is this something that could be applied to... Okay. I was surprised yesterday when, on your third talk, they were showing you a lot of velocity fields. It was velocity fields. I was going to ask the speaker if all of them were on real people. Because as far as I know, PIB was being uh, used, was going to be used with, um, with uh, ultrasounds in a technique that is called echo PIB. Um, the way the ultrasound works, I suspect, is I, because I don't remember well. I haven't had time to review this paper. I, I, I read them a long time ago. I think they were sort of integrating the velocity along the path because you usually put the ultrasound here and you have the detector here. Okay? But I think they claim they could do something similar to PID. But I was surprised if he was using it at a clinical level because I didn't think it was a technique at a clinical level. But I think it can be. This can be. Another thing I have read also from a people I knew was working on PAB, that they started a company for doing X-ray holography. Not just PAB, but also holography. Yeah. But I haven't seen it being used. So, but then they are... Okay, thank you. Yeah. I don't think that the well, IPH will be done. The echo PAV is when you in inject contrast bubbles. So you inject little yep. gas bubbles, yep. and then you can track them with ultrasound if you do fast imaging. Yeah, so yeah but the image... So the problem is only is like the resolution, the use of contrast. Yes. So yes. in that sense, it's yes. not super accurate. Yes. So yes. That's but the bubbles so. occupy the whole vessel. Uh, well, in the heart, no, it's quite small bubbles. Eh? So you can see them quite well with ultrasound. No, but, no, but what I mean is that if you can put them only on the middle plane, uh, uh, then no, you no. could measure the velocity on the middle plane because in a vessel which is cyl cyl uh, cylindrical, only the middle plane is important. The other one is, you can assume that. But you cannot do that. So, and I think with the ultrasound, what they measure is the change in, in frequency, which means change in position, something like that. So then I think they have the, the integration. I'm not sure, but that is true. The contrast is not the same, but the, the speaker yesterday was, was quite happy for telling. Any other questions here then? Thank you for your presentation. And what about employing the laser Doppler anemometry or velocimetry mm -hmm. instead of uh, the holography for uh, measuring uh, velocity? The question is? 
Uh, what about employing the laser, the laser okay. Doppler? Laser Doppler nanometry is a technique much older than PAB. I think 10 years old or something like that. Because at some point they celebrate the 25 years or one and 35 years of the other technique. The problem, uh, well, I know Doppler velocimetry is used a lot on the clinic with ultrasounds, I think. And why they are using this? Because the Doppler velocimetry only need one pixel, one sensor. And one of the problems with ultrasound is that the sensor for ultrasounds are not as big, and they don't have as much pixel as the sensor for optical lag. So you can do this Doppler with one, but you get only information on one point. And this is, I think this is really, this, that is used on the clinic a lot, I think. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, and then now it's coffee time. Thank you. Thank you.